Donnie and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business, we can help. We're in the process of changing the poll question. <laughs> Scott Niedermeyer was born in Edmonton, wasn't he? He was. But he grew up in Cranbrook. So you, you, we, you jumped the gun with that poll question without consulting. Absolutely. Rick and I. Yeah. And, and Paul Korea should be in there. Paul Korea from North Van. Well, one of the all-time greatest. It should be uh, uh, Ronnie. Um, yeah. By the way, I said Dwayne Loudermilk. I'm, I'm getting my great Laura Mainland athletes uh, mixed up. Played at Peony Minor Hockey. I met, Minor I don't Hockey. know why I mixed these two uh, gentlemen up, Mike Perovich. Okay. I don't know if you, I believe he was a draft pick of the Calgary Flames. All right. I, I played lacrosse against him. Great, great athlete. Uh, May Day, uh, as we wait for, uh, as we uh, hook up with Thomas Drance. Here's our next guest. It's uh, May Days at Passant Motors. All of our guests today brought to you by Passant. Huge promotions, greatest selection. Check out why Passant Motors is consistently the number one rated dealer in the lower mainland. Visit them online at passantmotors.com. Thomas Drance, BC born and bred, if one I'm, of the greatest. I'm not mistaken. Uh, from the uh, Athletic, he joins us now, as always, on a Friday. How are you, sir? You're not mistaken from the mean streets of Carisdale. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Carisdale <laughs> produced a hockey player or, or two, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, well, and, uh, in the 2023 NHL entry draft, Andrew Crystal, who may go in the first round, Carisdale born and bred. Oh, yeah. wow. There you nice. go. There, there's, a, there's somebody else out there, and the name is escaping me uh, right now. I'll get back to you on that, uh, on that uh, Thomas. Um what do you make of all the one-goal victories in, in, in these playoffs, including last night Dallas beating uh, Vegas in overtime 3-2? It's a hard time of year to win, and the games are close. You know, you look at teams, though, that win one-goal games, and over large samples, like if this were the regular season, right, you'd say, hey, that might be a concern. It might regress. But obviously you don't have a lot of time at this point. Like the Florida Panthers are 9-2. and two in one goal games to this point. Obviously, every single game they beat the Hurricanes in was a one goal game. And, you know, as much as we like to think like that a team has the capability to elevate their game when the chips are down and the and the tensions up, like typically speaking, teams don't repeat um, that skill year over year. Like a team with a really good record in one goal games one year is unlikely to do it again. And it's one of the things, you know, certainly I look at when tr trying to analyze team quality and target them for aggression. But when you only need four more wins, you know, there's not enough time for aggression. You've punched your ticket. You've given yourself a chance to win the cup. Um, one other team that excelled in one goal games was the 2007 Anaheim Ducks. They went 12 and two, but when you have, Chris Pronger and your and your uh, guest Scott Niedermeyer on the blue line. You know, I look at that and think, hey, that might be legit. That team might just have been impossible to score against. Um, you know, I don't know that I feel the same way about the Florida Panthers. I, I, it almost feels a little bit more like the 2003 Anaheim Ducks, right? The team that uh, got those scintillating performances from J.S. Jaguar uh, right through the Western Conference Final. Uh, they were 12-1 and one in one-goal games. Uh, fell short ultimately in the Stanley Cup final. But, um, you know, that th th for me anyway, one goal games, that's just a sign of how hard it is to win at this time of year. And, and by the time you get to overtime, truly, you're talking about a coin flip. Thomas uh, Arthur Silovs, uh, your thoughts on just obviously a great uh, World Hockey Championships. Does his play alter the views of the Canucks in terms of the backup for Demko next year at all? I, it shouldn't, right? Like, it yeah. shouldn't because... Yeah. For me, the better Arthur Silov's plays, the higher your regard for him yeah. as like a potential future NHL player and maybe an impact player, maybe a starter. Yeah. Like the more you think of him that way, I think the more important it becomes that he gets 50 plus games next season, regardless of what level he gets those games at. Right, Rick? Yes. So it's like the, the better he plays, it's almost more important that he start in the AHL as opposed to being your NHL backup. Here's what I do think it gives the Canucks. Like one thing that's excellent about Arthur Silov's uh, emergence as, as a realistic option at the NHL level. And it's not just the world's, uh, his performance at the world's that has put him in that conversation. It's his performance in the NHL. It's his performance in the American League, right? Like this is a goalie who's tracking 
uh, in a very positive way and looks like he's on the precipice of, of being capable of playing real NHL games for this team. I, I think one advantage they have with that is he's also waiver exempt. Like he can go up and down with no problem. And the Canucks now have a, a an American League affiliate locally in Abbotsford. Um, so one thing I sort of think about is, you know, we know they don't have money to spend on the backup position, yeah. right? We know they can't afford to bring in a more veteran backup. Um, we know that Thatcher Demko's gotten injured in both of the two years that he's been this team's bona fide starter. And that realistically playing him a more moderate uh, amount of games is going to be in this club's best interest, particularly if you want him to get hot in the playoffs, right? If you want him to go into the tournament with, with his best chance, like you, you really do need to keep him below 60 games in my view. Yeah. So how do you get, you know, 25 ish, at least league average, say percentage games in a world where you're not willing to spend on a backup and where, you know, clearly this organization, like, I mean, Spencer Martin lost his backup job to Colin Delia, even though he finished the season strong with some really good performances down in Abbotsford and into the playoffs. So, you know, one thing I sort of think they could consider is what the Carolina Hurricanes did with uh, Peter, Peter uh, Kachetkov, a uh, Dan Milstein client in Carolina. He he played 25-ish games in both the American League and the NHL last season. So he was kind of um, an AHL starter, but when Frederick Anderson got hurt, they brought him up to the NHL and gave him a chance to run with the ball. With with a player like Silovs, considering his, his waiver status, when the team's home, for example, he could easily come up and give them an N NHL game if they're facing a back-to-back -back situation or something like that. Uh, if Demko gets hurt, they could turn to Silovs in relief as opposed to turning to Spencer Martin. But when you go on the road... And when you're just sort of spelling Demko normally, it could be Spencer Martin. So I would say, you know, the Canucks are positioned to use Seelovs not as a backup, but as like a 2B, right? Where, where he'd split backup duties with Spencer Martin, but potentially be the guy they turn to in the event of an injury, in the event that you need a backup to step up and be like a starter for a three or four week stretch. Meanwhile, he could be your sort of number one down in Abbotsford. I think he could effectively do both. Um, and that would be how I'd approach it if I were the Canucks. And, and so what does this performance at the Worlds mean? I think it should give this team a lot more confidence in their ability to cobble together what they need from the backup goalie position between Silovs and Spencer Martin. Yeah, they might have to do by committee like last year, uh, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, uh, you're, you're, we haven't talked to you since uh, Vitelli uh, Kratsov signed in Russia, two-year deal. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean... It's one of those things where, and this is honestly one of the things that got me into the business, boys. Like when I was a fan in 2011 and the Canucks won the first two games and they were, remember, one goal victories. <laughs> mm -hmm. And everyone was like, well, it's over. The Canucks are going to win. And I was watching these games and I'm like, man, the Canucks have not looked as much better than the Bruins as I thought. And then they get blown out twice in Boston. Everyone's like, well, that's it. They're not going to win. And I was like, no, they're they're still the better team. Like they're in with a shot. They win. I mean, you know how the sort of um, pendulum swings in a playoff series. And one thing that I remember thinking as a fan was like, I want analysis that comes down the middle here, right? Like I want analysis that's not overreacting. And, and Vitaly Kratsov for me is like a reminder of that because – you know, he was acquired and, and the conversation was like, he could be a steal, right? And I was always like, I don't know about that. I think I think this is effectively like a waiver claim that, you know, they, they paid a small price, a, a deliriously small price. The price was right um, in order to take a shot, effectively jump the waiver queue and keep him from going to like an Arizona or a Detroit. Um, and then he came and, you know, he looked like a waiver claim. Like he, he didn't play well. He did, didn't have the work rate, I think, to really fit in with what Rick Tockett wants to do. Um, you know, I don't even know that the high end skill showed very often. There were occasional flashes. The physical game was here and there. Uh, you saw him throw a hit every, you know, every once, once every 10 games. And you thought, hey, you know, if that, if that was consistent, there might be something. And then he goes to the KHL. And some of the analysis is like, well, they gave up assets again for nothing. And it's like, no, no, no. They gave up assets to get the first look at this guy. And, you know, they they weren't super impressed with what they saw. That's fine. They paid they paid nothing. Like, the, the price was so meager that it was well worth the roll of the dice. Even though I wasn't a huge fan of, of the player, I could recognize that the cost was uh, effectively fine. And his departure to the KHL 
provided that the club qualifies him and, and retains their rights, which I know you've reported is is likely to happen, Rick. Yeah. Um, you know, that's fine too. Then if he pops in the, the KHL, maybe you have an asset or at least you have first dibs on, on a player who might, you know, have one of those Triamkin, Anton, Rodin style glow ups uh, after their North American experience goes poorly. So, you know, for me, it's just like a no harm, no foul situation from a Canucks perspective. And if you're going to make these sorts of like age gap gambles on guys, I'd far rather you do it on a player like Kratsov than on players like Dermot, Bear, um, you know, uh, who's the other guy they brought in? Studnika, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of those uh, Riley Stillman, some of those players that they brought in who've come attached to real costs, right? Second, third, fifth round picks. Uh, because for those players, I mean, first of all, you're paying, you know, a fair bit up front in draft capital, which I don't think this club can afford uh, to pay for, to be totally honest, uh, at least not to bolster their short term. But also, you know, and, and we're seeing it with Bear, we'll see it with Philip Peronic too, a year from now. You know, if those players hit, if they help your team, they immediately get really pricey, right? Like they're, they're immediately expensive. And that's sort of one of the things that this club's going to have difficulty navigating here, particularly given that they don't have a ton of cap space and particularly given that they're going to have to give some key players raises in the in the very near future. Elias Pettersson cheap among them. But now, you know, you sort of throw Bear into that list this summer as a result of, of that deal. And you'll throw Heronic into the mix, too, a year from now. Dave Heinmarch. From the K K Caresdale uh, Dunbar area. Oh, wow. A real significant player in NHL history. Well, I'll talk about that uh, in the next segment or later on uh, today. Thomas, thanks for this. We'll talk to you next uh, Friday. Sounds good. Thanks, boys. Enjoy your conversation with Scott. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Thomas Trans from uh, The Athletic.